morning or good afternoon, everyone. So it's a, it's a real uh, pleasure and an honor, actually, to, to see so many people here uh, for the official opening of the academic year and of the ICNC and EFAC program and uh, activity this year. Um, special honor to, to welcome the, the guests that we have today, very distinguished and, and, and special guests, uh, and the, the speakers of this panel, you'll hear more about it <laughs> later on. I just want to <laughs> say again, I mean, why we are here. So, as I think, uh, I don't have to remind anyone, <coughs> The ICNC, or the Interdisciplinary Center for Neural Computation, uh, which is actually a multidisciplinary center for neural computation, uh, was established uh, informally in, during 1987 workshop as an initiative of uh, two people who are sitting here together with, actually more than two who are sitting here, Moshe Abeles, Honor uh, Gottfried, Chaim Sempolinsky, and Danny Amit, who is not with us. And later on today, we will have a special uh, memorial lecture for him. And, and this was really not only a pioneering event in, uh, in the history of uh, brain science in Israel, but I think it was uh, one of the first places in the world where the recognition of multidisciplinarity for brain research uh, was recognized and, and, and materialized. And as, as you, you know, in 1992, the center, the ICNC, uh, took a, a formal form with the initiation of a, a very special PhD program and a collaboration between something like 20, 20 to 30 uh, scientists from many different disciplines around the core of computational and theoretical methods, but we had experimentalists from all over the the range of neuroscience from the very beginning. And uh, the fact that uh, this PhD program and the, the idea of the multidisciplinary activity in brain science was a good idea, that the fact that it was successful, I think we can see today mainly, not only in the, the presence of so many good students now, but in the fact that <coughs> this center gave birth essentially to at least three other centers in Israel, or at least the, one is the Gonda Center that Moshe Abeles formed uh, almost 12 years after that. Uh, I think that the, the Weizmann Institute followed us in some sense, uh, although of course they had neuroscience before, but the idea of taking multidisciplinary connected, <coughs> connected with computer science, connected with theoretical physics to some extent, and actually maybe the best evidence that this was really the, the seed of everything is the fact that our graduate students, I mean, the the core faculty of the other centers, the Goddard Device Institute, and now ELSA, actually the new center, which is also a daughter of the ICNC, is based on graduates of this program. So I can only mention the three Weizmann, uh, Nachum Olenovsky, Ronnie Paz, and, and, and Elad uh, Schneidman, all graduates of the ICNC, and the, the three or more at, at, at the Gonda Center, uh, Gal Cechik, uh, uh, Dana, Dana and Izhar, uh, all coming from the ICNC, and I think we also have uh, quite a few uh, young, young and, and, and very vibrant faculty members who came from the program. So I think at least we did something right. We managed somehow to create this very special breed of scientists who are able to communicate with not only neuroscientists, but psychologists and computer scientists and physicists and mathematicians and philosophers <coughs> and linguists and, and many others and psychologists, in some sense creating a new new type of science which I think attracted all of you to this place right, right now and, and really aims at uncovering or resolving this big mystery of how the brain works. Now, as I already said, I mean, the energy and the power of this program and center was always the PhD students. And, and the, the PhD students today, I, we all hope, are at least as good as, as the PhD students in the past. 
And an excellent evidence for this is, is this meeting. <laughs> this meeting was uh, initiated and organized by two of our younger students, uh, Evan Matan, who, who wanted to have some sort of special event uh, to open this, this year. But they did such a good work, such a good job, that we don't have space for so many people. So <laughs> actually, we should have moved to the Bible Auditorium or something. And I'm sure they could feel that as well. So, so this is really an attempt to deal with the, the fundamental issue, not only <coughs> what has we learned about the brain, but, but what is the future of, of, of brain research. And did we actually establish anything new in the last 20, 30 years since the, the recognition that the brain is an interesting problem and we should use many different uh, approaches to study. So I really want to congratulate Matan and Eva for, for its achievement this year. And uh, I want to let them uh, guide the, the panel from here. So I'm, I'm sure it's going to be stimulating and, and it's going to be interesting. The only problem is that we have too many excellent people and, and too little time for, for each one of them. So we have to be very, very careful about it. Uh, allow me just one special note. Moshe Abelet, who is sitting here, was really the initiator and, and the director of MSNC. And I think he was responsible to a large extent to, to the success of this story. Because he, follow, he was followed by Dan Seger and Heinz Polinski later on, and Elon now as the new director of the center, of the largest center, and even much more ambitious center. Moshe is retiring this week at the age of 75 from uh, his directorship of the second chief. Huh? He's cheating. He's cheating. Yeah. <laughs> of course, all of you who, knows, who know Moshe uh, should know that his energies are really endless. <laughs> It's not only the ICNC and the brain science in Jerusalem that the uh, largest are due to him. He managed to do it twice and be very successful <coughs> twice. And he promised everyone that despite the fact that the whole thing is moving to another person, to Moshe Bar, Bar Ilan, he will continue to do science. And I encourage all the young students here to apply for him to, to, for, to work with Moshe because this is obviously an experience that no one to me. So allow me at this point to congratulate Moshe again and, and welcome him and, and wish him 30 more years of scientific activity. I'm sure he will do it. <laughs> All right, so I, I, I give the microphone to... You don't, you don't want to say anything? We do, but Ellie. Ellie. Who is the next one? <coughs> okay, so you want to invite the next one? Ellie. No, no. Okay, so Ellie. Okay, I'm here because uh, as a director of the PhD program, and uh, since uh, Matan and Eva are students of the PhD program, I have to say something. So I'll just say that uh, five of the eight people who are going to present here were my teachers when I did my PhD, and uh, clearly I didn't listen to them because. I'm not doing anything that they see as the right future of, the, of uh, brain research. And I hope that the students who are here will listen to them better than I did. <laughs> okay. Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, we organized this conference in an attempt to receive answers from leading researchers in neuroscience to questions that we find both basic and important. And the rationale behind those questions was to link the past and future of brain research through the present. And uh, we're very glad to see that we are not the only ones who find these questions relevant and interesting. So without further delay, let us introduce the format of the conference. The speakers are divided into four pairs in each pair, the first speaker will have 25 minutes to express his position. Next, the second speaker will have 15 minutes to express his own position. Afterwards, the audience will be invited to ask questions. So, each couple has defined the issue on which they will debate. The purpose of this uh, format is to generate a live discussion during which we will be able to better understand the strengths and weaknesses of the arguments. All this in the spirit of Machloket <laughs> Shamayim. 
due to the intensity of the conference, we will be strict, strict on times. We ask the audience to remain patient with your questions until after both speakers have finished. Before we begin, we want to thank the speakers that agreed to take part in the conference, the head of the ICNC, Professor Tali Tishbi, and the head of ELSEC, Professor Elon Vadia, for their support, the administrative staff of ELSEC and ICNC, who assisted us along the way, Ruti, Rafi, Nizar, Itai, Ravid, Hussein, and Meira. And last but not least, we would like to express our deep thanks to Professor Elin Elkan, without whom this wouldn't have happened. Our first couple are Professor Yadin Dudeid from the Weizmann Institute and Professor Chaim Pompolinsky from the Hebrew University. The title of their discussion is From Molecules to Mind and Back. It's the first time that I hear that we are a couple. <laughs> 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 Do I need it? Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Eva and Matan from the fair Matan and Eva. Uh, I think you are already right to introduce the Eurovision next time. <laughs> I really appreciate that. And I am really very thankful for uh, the organizers for inviting me. It's, uh, it's an amazing audience, I can tell you. I'm, I'm really impressed. So, uh, and as you know, Tali, I'm very appreciative of what's going on here. And that's the reason why we try to get all you get best students for our faculty. <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm really admiring you. Uh, so, let me see. Yeah. Uh, I uh, noted the three questions. And uh, I'm actually going to uh, pass on on the first one, which is... Uh, what is the theory discovery from the history of brain research that have great influence or the greatest influence in my view? First, just to start to be a bit provocative, I don't think there are theories in brain research. There are models. And there is a big difference between a theory and a model. Theories are only in physics, but that's my own view, and I want to start with something that will prime the audience. Uh, second, it will come up later on, because it depends on the level in which we discuss. So. Uh, Without further ado, I, this is the title of our conversation, and I would like to start with several tenets. Those are my personal tenets. I'm quite <coughs> confident that in the audience some people will not necessarily accept them, but it's important for me to present them because they portray the conceptual framework. And some of them might be obvious to you, but some are not. So this is my definition of the brain. It's an information processing biological organ that anticipates or construes the world, both of them, maintains homeostasis and guides behavior. And the reason I bring it here is not because I invented the definition of the brain. There are many definitions possible. I emphasize here biological organ, which means if you study the brain, you have to take into account it's a biological organ. It's not a theoretical construct. It's something that has been created and has probably had evolved in evolution. Second, including uh, in, included in the, in the tasks, or in the, what I see as the task, and I'm not the only one, is homeostasis. We tend to forget it. We should keep an eye on that, because this is something that in most models up to about a few years ago was disregarded. In my view, uh, this involves computations made over internal representations. I'll define what, an, uh, what, what is the meaning of that, but because internal representation is a terminology or a term used in various disciplines in different ways. So in my construal of that, it is the most basic reductionist approach, which means whenever you have information in event space A represented in event space B, regardless of how this information was generated and what are the parts of the representation, this is an internal representation. Or you can say representation, but I use internal representation because I'm referring to the representation in the brain. So internal representations are the generic, Definition, not mine, is maps of event space A in event space B. This is taken from computational, uh, from Cooper uh, and, and others. In the brain, it's ev event space A is the world. The world is the brain itself as well. So it's a bit complicated here, and we have to think about it. But when I refer here as first approximation to the world, I mean the body and the outside world. The body and the outside world. 
The brain is not dissociated from the body. In brain research, we almost always tend to regard the brain as separate. And it's something that comes up in, in recent research as well. And uh, event space B is the neuronal coding space. I assume nothing about what the code is. I don't know. And as you'll see in about 30 seconds, this is for me the 64 shekel, thousand shekel question. The adaptionist version is neuronally encoded structures, versions of the world that could potentially guide behavior. This is for me the key to understanding the brain. And there's six, as I said, 64 shekel, 64,000 shekel, I, I used to say dollars, but the shekel is much stronger. How are internal representations encoded and manipulated or from in the brain to result in a specific behavior? which means when I study, I have to find out what is the code and how a specific behavior is culminating from that computation. An additional consideration, if you wish a complication, but it's a given, it's not something that we can deal with, is that obviously it's a multi-level system and everybody in the audience here knows that it's a multi-level system. And I'm not going to go over the levels, they're obvious. And you can actually decide what the level is on the basis of your experience or your inclination. There is the fact that some people will say this is a molecular level, this is a cellular level, there are no real boundaries between them. But we should pay attention to the fact that representations of the computations are performed very probably in each of these levels. Not only in a single one, but this is the point I'll come back to. The point which is most important for me is where is the content of the information considering a specific behavior. Which means it's quite obvious for me that Parts of the representations are encoded even, let's say, in the interaction, in the, in the tyrosine phosphorylation of you know, the 2B subunit of the MDR receptor. I, I spill out these terms just to show you that I know that, but it's not important. You can use whatever you wish. It's as a large segment says, conviction. But the information is also encoded in molecules, in specific molecules, if you wish, in specific residues in molecules. And then it, we have to decide how much defining the representation that we are interested in. So we'll touch upon that as well. There are multiple types of levels in brain research. I'm quite confident that almost everybody in the audience is familiar with that. There are three types of types of uh, levels. One is the level of organization, which is the common, the commonly used in uh, the lay person literature and in some biological literature, which means it's by size, by dimension, structural hierarchy. For example, from the molecules, uh, behavior, or if you wish, to society. So you proceed from angstroms or uh, microns to meters or kilometers, depends how this, if you go into society. And low level can uh, still be highly complex, which means the fact that we call something a low level doesn't mean that it's not complex. On the contrary, probably. There is level of processing, which is the hierarchy of information processing. Sitting here and looking at some of the best people in the world in uh, information processing, I should not, uh, or in sensor perception. Uh, this is quite obvious, the highest level being the most distant from the input or the one encoding the most global representation. It's not necessarily the same. And there is the level of analysis, which is the most important from my point of view. Not important, all of them are important, but the most useful. And these are the levels of the operation of a problem, which is the classical. There is the uh, David Marr in 1982. Uh, where he defined the level of the computational objective or the goal of the system, which is the highest level in our terminology, the algorithm in which this computational goal is implemented, and the implementation in the hardware. And of course, the lower we go, lower okay? But the lower we go, the more we are protein is a biological material. The algorithm is constrained by the biological material from the biological data. So you already see what I'm trying to uncover here, the fact that you cannot detach that from the strict biology. So neuroscientists come in multiple flavors. I'm trying to define them here, and uh, this came after a discussion uh, two days ago with Chaim. Uh, I uh, sort of extended a bit the, the, uh, the, the distinctions or the classification of the taxonomy. So if I would take a classification which is easy to remember uh, of neuroscientists that I know, or if you wish, if you open the, uh, let's say, the directory of the Society for Neuroscience, only about uh, 44,000, I think, about 40,000 people, um, then you can classify them. So there are those whom I would call here topists. 
those are people that are testing the computational theory level only. They are not really interested in what's going on inside. They are interested personally. They do not belittle it. But they deal with the theory. And for them, I assume that you can take any machine that will perform the same and will achieve the same goal, and that's fine. So this is the computational level. And uh, the cons of that, I don't give the pros, because in pros are obvious. The cons, uh, despite focusing only on the goal level, they, one may lack knowledge of what the biological goal really is. It's very often misleading. I'll give you just one example very briefly. We can discuss it later. We have this very famous uh, memory system, which is the pinnacle of human cognition, which is episodic memory. Episodic memory is very few. Uh, you're not going to remember. Even if you wish, you are not going to remember what I'm saying here with accuracy. You're going to fake part of it. So episodic memory is a memory system that probably had evolved over many years, so many, too many eons, I don't know how long, in order to generate a system that is inaccurate. So it's funny. It's like having a computer that you type something and then you get something else when you open it. So one of the reasons is very probably that the goal of the system is not episodic memory. Very probably the goal of the system is imagination. Now, if you don't attend the biology and the psychology, you may work on that system not knowing what the real goal is. I'm not claiming this is the real goal. This is a suggestion for the goal. So uh, they may also miss the excitement and revelations of biological mechanisms which unveil new avenues for new theories. So again, there are a lot of pros on their side, but I'm trying to bring the cons, because it should be a provocative action, or at least try to. That's what I got from the team Matan and F. Now there are the top-down. Those people started the theory level, but hope to tap into the algorithmic level, and ultimately, hardware and implementation. They hardly do that. They hardly deal with the hardware implementation, some do, uh, they, and we'll touch, uh, one of the questions that I'll leave you with in a few minutes is whether they ever do that seriously, and, uh, but they know that you cannot, stay, you cannot stick to the computational level if you wish to study a biological system. You have to, from there, go over and uh, ask questions about how, how is the goal achieved and how is it implemented in, in the brain. So the cons, the risk, lack of appreciation of the biological constraints, which means sometimes we find a system and we are very happy and we, a logical system, the brain is one of them, and we try to explain how it works and so on and so on, and we think that it works in a certain way because it's adaptive. That's how we are trained. That's how Danny trained me. Something is adaptive. That's why it, uh, it evolves in evolution, or at least that's what you think. And uh, in many cases, it might be wrong because very possibly there might be constraints in the system that do something that could not have been done otherwise. This is called in biology and in psychology the Paglossian paradigm. Dr. Paglos was the mentor of uh, Candide, uh, and he said that everything is for the good. And uh, when he was hanged, he said also it's good. So uh, the Paglossian paradigm is the opposite of the adaptionist paradigm. Uh, sorry, it's the adaptionist paradigm. It says uh, whatever is there is part of the system. Uh, but in many cases, you find out that the system is built in a certain way because it cannot be done otherwise. For example, I'll take an example from my own research of my own field, you take consolidation, memory consolidation. You can find reasons in theory and reasons in algorithms why there is a consolidation period in which memory is transformed from short into long term. But there is also a possibility that there is a consolidation period because the system is built of molecules made out of protein that cannot be done other it cannot be done otherwise. So I'm just bringing this as a very brief example for discussion if you wish. They may also lose sight of their presence special contributions of molecules and cells, because they start with a certain level, they become committed to it. So that's a question now. Now there are those that I call <coughs> bottom up and those that start with implementation and hope to, uh, that the algorithms of theories will emerge. It rarely happens. Usually they will adapt something from those who started with theories. Uh, but many of us are like that, and they may get astray on the road to the computational goal. So let's see how we proceed. Now there are the bottomists. I know the connotation of this word may be wrong, but uh, those are people that attend only the hardware, <coughs> and they care less about what, is it, what it implements. So I have many good friends who are excellent scientists. I admire them, and uh, they will remain my friends, I hope, after this talk as well. And they may spend their life on the residue serine 1 until 3 in the Krebs uh, uh, transcription factor and hope one day to find out what's the role of, what's the role of it. So uh, this is good. This is very important. But 
We are dealing here with brain research, and these people could lose the brainness of the brain, which means the brain is a brain. And uh, serine 23, there is serine 23, as I remember, and in crab is important by itself, but how is it going to tell us about the brain? So you lose the brainness of the brain. You, 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 you sort of go. Now, there are two uh, uh, taxonomy here that I leave aside, uh, knowing that if I go into them, I probably generate increase uh, tremendously the number of my enemies. They are not real enemies. So they are the topless and the bottomless. So the bottomless are those that will go from the serine 123 into the uh, carbon atom or the phosphoryl or the phosphoryl groups. They will descend down and go into chemistry. This is very important. I was trained as about physics. So that's extremely important. But how do you get from there to the brain? And the top are those that uh, usually after retirement go and ask questions about consciousness and drugs. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think it's very important, and I would not argue that the questions about are not important, but depends where you approach it for. Yeah. So we have we have a top list, top down is bottom up is bottom is and topless and bottomless on the side. In practice, that the selection of level is important, which means it's essential. For young scientists, from my point of view, this is the most important decision you are going to make. This is my view. Which level do you enter the system? It's more important than which graduate student program you, you join. You join the beautiful graduate program, so it's nothing against that. But it's more important even and who is your mentor. Which level you are going to enter to, to use as an entry level into the system? Which level of analysis should one enter the project or career in veteran research? My favorite. I call it focus reductionism. It depends on what question you are learning about memory. So for me, the most important level is that level in which, which is the meaning level at which the meaning of the representation of what is learned is encoded. The minimal one for me to try and to find out. So for example, in the case of Pavlovian conditioning, for me, it's not something I'm doing now, but for I were to enter it now, for me the level will be cells and uh, simple circuits. Because this is the level in which the conditioning in my view would be expressed for the first time as a behaviorally meaning behaviorally meaningful condition. Questions for debate. Which entry level is to be preferred? And I'm quite sure that time will pursue that in some somewhere or another. Now let's just make sure. All levels are legitimate. The question is which one is best fitted for your goal? And again, from my point of view, I tell my students this is the most important decision you're going to make. Because in academic career, very often, the minute you enter a certain level, you're going to stick to that. What are the pros and cons of specific entry levels? I try to formulate briefly some, but this is something for discussion. Because it's my view, I may be wrong. Can one indeed shift from one level to another, or is it only lip service? This is the critical point for me. Many times we say, let's study this, uh, let's take it from my experience, uh, let's study this by a physical system, and hope to reach the mind somewhere in the future. For that, I need psychology, I need computer scientists, I need computational scientists, physicists, and I need some biologists, and so on and so on. Will it ever happen, or will I find myself, it didn't happen in my case, but will I find myself always cranking papers on the same level of analysis because it's the only thing I can do? So when you have an entry level, it's critical for you to understand that there is a commitment in that that might schlep you to the same level again and again. And a question for the rest of the debate. How would we know that we know? Suppose we study memory. How would we know that we reach the stage where we know that we understand what memory is. This is the general question. And here I wish to conclude my remarks with a philosopher that I'm in love with. Physically, he's dead for three centuries now. So that's Platonic love. His name was Giambattista Vico. Uh, I'm sure that in the audience, especially in, uh, in uh, people who work on linguistics and uh, ever, uh, uh, you know who he was. He was a great mind that I think never or seldom left uh, Napoli, which by itself says that there's something wrong there. He never left, or maybe left only once or twice. 
And uh, he, coined, he, he uh, started his career in uh, scholastic philosophy, which was related to religion. But he coined something that came from f a scholastic philosophy, which is emerging again and again in brand research, in, uh, for example, issues that relate to motor theories of perception and of action, uh, and mirror neurons or whatever, and so on and so on, and comes back again and again in science. What he said was that, translated into simple language, because Latin I don't know, and I have it somewhere, what he meant was that you understand only if you do, which means complete understanding of a system requires you to be able to do the system, or if you wish, if you end up in a certain body of knowledge, if you now can, and I hate to use this term because the connotation for some people in the first rows is very different, if you now can simulate the system so it, it's exactly the same coordinates as the original one, you understand how it works. So for me, the Vicos criterion, this who does knows is a criterion that will pop up and emerge and uh, resurface in our discussion again and again if we come back to the question how do we know that we know something? So I leave the, the, the stage for uh, Chaim, uh, and I would like to reiterate the three questions that are more directly related to uh, the remarks so far. Which entry level is to be preferred? Because we are talking here about from molecules to mind effect, so we're talking about levels. Which entry level is to be preferred? What are the pros and cons of specific entry levels, which are extremely important? And can one indeed shift from one level to another, or is it only lip service? And of course, lip service is provocation. It's, uh, it's some very serious way. So uh, I thank you for your attention, and uh, hope that you'll consolidate some of the classification, uh, uh, especially the last one. Thanks a lot. multidisciplinarity has been the, uh, the motor 
uh, uh, in the field, uh, but also technology developed uh, to the extent that uh, uh, molecular biology and, and, and genetics uh, is becoming a, a, a standard tool in, in system neuroscience. So uh, the question of going from the molecular level to the system level uh, is, is not so dramatic as it used to be. And, and similarly for theory, uh, the question, uh, do you go from one level to another? Are you staying in your own level? I think we, the, both the, the development of computer power, computing power, and also theorists, uh, uh, theory, uh, theorists uh, uh, in the field uh, uh, are in, in brought the field uh, to, to the state that uh, that it's quite it's quite easy to, to move from one level to another. You can uh, at one side do an abstract theory at a very high level, information theoretic level, without even having neurons then, and then the next day you do uh, by some neural, neural network, and then uh, you can uh, later on uh, add uh, uh, neurons with dendrites and synapses and whatever, uh, to a degree there is already a very flexible and dynamic uh, transitions between levels that you already see now. So, so the, 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 the practical question uh, uh, or, or the, and the, the professional aspect of choosing a point of entry and being worried about, about staying there, I think it's less, uh, it's less uh, 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 crucial uh, or central today than it used to be uh, in this field. However, the, the very same developments, I think, highlighted or enhanced uh, and amplified uh, the, the fundamental problem in the field, or I would say the meta problem in the field that uh, has been with us for a long time, but I think now uh, it is even more, uh, uh, more challenging or more obvious. And this is that uh, we do not have a good idea how to dissect the, the, the brain problem or the brain phenomenon. Uh, we, we, we all un want to understand the brain, but what does it mean? The brain, a whole uh, uh, complex organism, uh, all its parts are, are interacting. And as we know from, from recent advances in, in, in research, uh, the, the mixing of the interactions between, between levels or between scales uh, are so are such uh, and, and so strong uh, that it's becoming more and more difficult uh, to uh, to come up with good uh, with, with uh, to to defend uh, at least the conventional uh, separations uh, and 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 dissections about uh, of the problem. This is this is an enormous challenge uh, because uh, it, it, it looks like a hopeless. Uh, a, a mission to understand the system if you cannot really justify how, you, uh, 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 how do you take apart this problem and divide it uh, into smaller, simpler uh, problems. And, th th and, and this question come up in various, uh, various variants. For instance, the modularity, the question of the modularity of the brain. You, you study uh, one, uh, one system, one area, primary auditory cortex or, or primary visual cortex or whatever. I mean, in what, uh, how do you justify thinking about this as, in some sense, a module, an independent system, interacting with the rest, but still something that, that can be thought of as a system uh, of its own? So the, the issue of modularity, uh, we know how uh, th there are so many influences of, uh, uh, of different areas in the brain on other areas, uh, so, so this is a question. And another way to put it is the levels, um, the molecular level, the cellular level, and so on. We know how, uh, it, uh, how sometimes a single, a few spikes uh, generated by a single neuron or by small groups of neurons can affect behavior. So there is enormous leaking between the, the direct uh, uh, emergence of effect on the macro uh, 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 perception uh, from, from, uh, from a very microscopic uh, event. Uh, so, so how do we deal with this? So uh, in physics, uh, the, the issue of levels translates sort of more or less painlessly and immediately to the issue of scales. So you have scales in, in space and you have scales in time, scales in energy and so on. And that, that works very nicely in, 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 in areas of physics 
And in some way, uh, I think in, in neuroscience we try to copy it. We thought about the molecular molecules, I don't know, angstroms, I don't know what molecules are angstroms, but anyway, uh, 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 nanoscale, let's say. Very small. Uh, very, very small. Ones. Okay, very good. Uh, but, but, uh, but, uh, but to talk about spatial scale and perhaps also about time scale, uh, milliseconds up to hours and so on. Uh, but we all, we all know that the, 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 those scales are, are, are basically one spectrum and there are no gaps uh, between those scales. So the questions of how to uh, really uh, define different uh, scales and different modules or different levels, I think is the fundamental problem which we, we, we must make some progress on it. And the way I, I, I suggest to look at this problem is rather to ask, to, to put it in the context of the questions that we ask in our research. So w w what type of questions we, we ask when we do research? This is another way of putting the, the, the taxonomy that we had in, had in, had in did uh, without uh, uh, in different terminology. And I think there are basically three types of questions that, that, uh, that we ask. Uh, the first question is, uh, I would say, descriptive questions, uh, basically mapping what, the, what are there uh, in, 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 in parts of the brain. It's mostly about structure and anatomy, but not always. Sometimes, uh, so in anatomy is obvious, what, are, what parts uh, are in the brain and what are the connections and so on and so forth, uh, what are the cell types, um, what kind of molecules uh, and, and, and are in, in, in different cells, etc. So these are descriptive, they are not really driven by a question or a hypothesis, just to give us the basic data uh, about the brain. Uh, it, it's extremely important, but again, uh, more or less painless, boring, uh, and so on. Um, the next level, I think, which most of us deal with is, the, is, the, is a mechanistic level. Question, here we have a question, we have a phenomenon, and we want to understand what is the mechanism of phenomena. So basically, we have phenomenon A, and we want to understand it by saying, well, there is a, there's something B, a process, or, 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 or an item, or an element in the system, that is the mechanism <laughs> for phenomenon A. So this is the mechanistic uh, question. We can, we can uh, uh, for the lack of time, I won't write down. Uh, we can call it the what question, right? Uh, 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 I'm sorry, the how question, right? How, how things operate, how uh, a certain behavior uh, emerges from, uh, from the neural system. So all these questions are basically mechanistic questions, and this is where all the, uh, the, the, the problem of what is, uh, what, what explanation is a, is, a, is a valid explanation? How, to what details we have to go until we say we understand the mechanism? Do we have to build the brain or simulate the brain with all the glorious details in order to say, well, we are satisfied with having a mechanistic explanation? And, uh, and uh, as I said, al already alluded, I, I don't think that, the, that we have a satisfactory uh, answer to that. But I think part of the problem and part of the solution is uh, that, that uh, those questions, the, the what and how questions should not exhaust uh, the, the type of questions that we should ask uh, and, and implicitly already ask about the brain. The what and how, the descriptive and mechanistic, and mechanistic, mechanistic questions are basically questions that we ask about any physical system. So there is no difference between the brain or any other biological system and other, and other physical system uh, out there. We ask what, what the physical system uh, uh, consists of uh, and, and what are the mechanisms underlying uh, ferromagnetic uh, uh, phenomena, superconductivity, uh, fluid uh, flow in, in, in a pipe, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, these, are, these are the type of questions. But I think what distinguishes the brain, but not only the brain, biology, which distinguishes biology from physics, is that in biology we have also questions of function, functional questions. Uh, I would even say functional questions is like the why question. Why is this system there? What is the goal of this system? Now, uh, so, so this is, I think, something which is, is new in biology and, it's, uh, and, and, and also neuroscience is part of, the bio of biology and, uh, and it's foreign to, uh, uh, to physics and it's foreign to us as physicists in particular or to any of us that come from physical sciences uh, uh, to 
ask this question, actually for computer science, it's, the, it's more natural because that's what they build systems uh, because they are designed to do something. But as a physicist, what does it mean to ask to, to address that function of the system? Who decides what the function of the system? What is the purpose of the system? And that's essentially uh, a, a problem which uh, is enormous for the brain, but it is generic for, for biology. What is the function of a cell of an organism? How do we specify it? And, the, and, and this is an old debate and, uh, 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 and, uh, and uh, arguments uh, are raging in, I would say, philosophy of biology or evolutionary biology or whatever. Uh, how do we define functionality of a biological system? And uh, for, for a while I thought that basically the ultimate answer to this uh, is uh, uh, result in evolution. The ultimate question about functionality is the, uh, uh, is the, the things that have evolved uh, and, uh, and survived the, the, the evolutionary process, and that also Yadin already hinted, hinted to it. Uh, and indeed, we all know the, the famous quotation from the genetist uh, 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 Dobzhansky that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of, uh, of evolution. So there is no sense of, uh, we cannot make sense of biology. And if, if this is true, we cannot make sense of the brain of neuroscience uh, phenomenon uh, uh, without uh, accepting the context of evolution. Now, this is, this is, this is in principle, it's very nice answer. So, ultimately, what we have to explain is how this organ evolved to perform whatever it performs. In practice, and maybe also in principle, there are big problems with it, and, and they are well known. Already, Yadin mentioned uh, all kinds of uh, constraints or epiphenomena or ex historical accidents that uh, uh, that uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, have led to uh, to to some something which we may think about them now as functions, things which historically have ne nothing to do with functions. Today, the system, the living system, uses them as functions. So, shall we consider them as accidents or shall we consider them as functions? Uh, but most importantly, it's not practical because we don't have the data to make a, 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 to make. A, uh, 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 um, to make some uh, serious and, and, and uh, plausible model uh, of the evolution of an organ like the brain. Uh, so what do we do with this? So I, I like the, again a quotation from one of the philosophers of biology that said that for the most part of it, even bio all bio most of the biologists, even molecular biologists, are methodological creationists. They simply they believe in evolution, of course, but they simply ignore it when they do the research. Even molecular biology, when for the most part of it, they add stories about evolution to uh, have papers accepted in some uh, preceded journals, but in their research, uh, they simply ignore, for the most part of it, evolutionary perspective. They just look at the system and its current state and its current functionality. So, so then we are back to the question of if we, if we ignore history, the, the, the aspect, uh, the evolutionary history of the system, what, how do we define function? Now, there are, there are one way to, to, to deal with it is to, to, to use evolution not as a, uh, in, in, in its uh, history uh, or historical aspect, but to evolution in, in a forward-looking uh, 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 approach, namely uh, take evolution or evolutionary dynamics as a criterion for the, for the functionality of the present system. So in that sense, we say, well, a, a, a particular uh, biological system or the brain or particular process, uh, uh, its function is defined to, uh, to enhance the survival of the, of, uh, of the system, of the organism. Now, not about history, not what happens uh, uh, in, in the past or may not have happened in the past, but this is as a criterion for the functionality of the system. Is it now uh, more adaptive or, or more fit to survive? You can add survival, you can add self reproduction, you can have a species, a reproduction of the species, etc., etc. All these evolutionary sort of goals and functions, but use them as criterion to assess the functionality of the system now, not uh, independent more or less about its history. I think that's, that's an interesting approach to think about and to try maybe to develop it about the brain. I don't know if it is practical or not. Uh, another approach, maybe complementary approach, but another approach which has been discussed in much in, again, philosophy, biology, if you want to, uh, to call it, uh, is, is basically function is, uh, is a relative term. 
is turned to another capacity. So you have some you have some capacity in mind, for instance, memory. So that's the capacity that you hypothesize uh, about the system. And then you say, well, what is the function of a consolidation process? So you can define the function of a, a consolidation relative to basically another capacity or another function that you hypothesize about the system. Uh, that's a very ad hoc approach uh, in, in a way because we don't have an overriding uh, principle how to choose those functions, but it uh, at least gives us some some sense perhaps of how to develop uh, the methodology uh, in, in, in a hierarchical fashion. And we maybe start with some hypotheses about uh, the capacities of the system, as I said, memory, uh, a, a motor uh, behavior, uh, this or that, and so on. Uh, and, uh, and then we, we, uh, we, we study uh, the, the system to look for, uh, for subsystems or subprocesses that serve the function in the sense that they, 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 they perform subfunctions which are derived to reserve uh, the function, the overall, the, the function of the of the entire system. So I don't have, of course, a, a good uh, good story how to go about it, but it seems to me that it's uh, the only way about about well, I don't know the only way, but uh, but uh, but one one suggestion that uh, that I have in mind is that when uh, instead of of, uh, of trying to um, to uh, focus on levels of organization or levels of abstractions or scales in the brain shift the perspective to address the question of levels and scales and, and hierarchies of functions. And then uh, basically derive from the hierarchy of functions two more. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> two, more, two more minutes. I'm done. I'm, I'm done. That's, that's the end of it. So, so basically I, I, I have in mind uh, a, an agenda which, uh, which, uh, which uh, which uh, is to, to uh, a theoretical agenda, basically, to, to make sense or to, to make more formal and concrete uh, the notion of a high notice of function using uh, ideas from computation, using ideas from information theory, from uh, statistical physics, but not directly on the brain, but more abstractly on, on, on high notice of functional system. Try to make more formal, what do you mean by vision? What do you mean to explain vision? What do you mean to explain memory? Vision has many, many parts in it. So, uh, so I, I think if we understand better, uh, that was another sign, the more <laughs> obvious one. Uh, if we understand better, uh, in, in, uh, maybe in a formal sense, uh, the, the st inner structure of functions, we can then start, as I said, from a hypothesis about, about an overall uh, functions and then look at their internal structures and try to see if the, uh, some parts of the brain, some mechanisms uh, fit I into the role that is, uh, is, uh, uh, is hypothesized uh, in, uh, in the functional uh, hierarchy. Basically, I don't believe there is objective uh, function independent uh, um, way to dissect the brain. It's one complex system. The only way to dissect it is by dissecting the functions that we think the brain is serving. Thank you. that I wish to bring, uh, bring up a caveat, which is the differentiation between using a tool and researching that field in which the tool emerges. 
So, for example, we all use, uh, f when I was a student, I used electron microscopy, uh, electron, uh, electron microscope, and uh, uh, ultrasound fuses. I, I, I never understood exactly how they work, and all I knew is that I had to call the, 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 the person in charge of it. So, we should be careful, in my view, we should be careful, especially, particularly in a multidisciplinary uh, school, uh, not to confuse the fact that we use a tool with the fact that there are people who do research and understand how to improve or negate <coughs> that tool. I think this is, a, this, is a ver this is an important distinction, but nevertheless, if I, uh, if I uh, uh, look at uh, how this uh, field of uh, 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 molecular system neuroscience evolves, it, it started with, uh, with uh, a system neuroscientist uh, using uh, those, uh, those genetic and molecular tools as black boxes without understanding them. But I think this is not true anymore. You see more and more people that, uh, that take the, the, the challenge upon themselves to develop, uh, to further develop those tools, and on, on, on the way, they, deep, they, uh, they uh, dig deeper into the system, and they learn about it, they understand it, and I think you see already here, and it, it reflected in our program, um, uh, molecular neuroscience was never part of our course uh, uh, cur curriculum, and now it is part. Uh, so uh, this uh, this uh, th this process uh, fil filters in, in, uh, and uh, uh, into uh, more than using tools, uh, uh, asking questions, being uh, being exposed, uh, and uh, and uh, and being aware uh, and being interested uh, in molecular uh, processes and cellular processes. And I think the tools are most importantly the tools allow the researcher. To uh, to have in the same lab uh, a, a, a research which uh, which asks both molecular and system and cellular <coughs> questions, as as it is true for theory and experiment, the same <coughs> lab uh, we can see the same research spans both experiment uh, and theory, and some researchers and definitely students move uh, smoothly uh, a smooth, uh, in a smooth way. Uh, from one to another. So distinction, I agree, but uh, nevertheless, the facts uh, are, and, the, and the, the, the way the dynamics of the of the field is that those separations are much less rigid than they used to be. Chaim, I think that you are over optimistic. I think that Chaim is a bit over optimistic, uh, and the reason is <laughs> a few second name. <laughs> Chaim over optimistic, Sapolinsky. So. I think the issue that you bring up is an interesting one, especially for younger scientists, and that's that I think that whereas, let's say, 30 years ago, people thought that they can conquer an issue by themselves, now it comes up that in order to do real state-of-the-art cutting edge research in neuroscience, you indeed need a group with several professions together. It's extremely difficult to master all this together. And uh, I think this is important because it also impinges on an ego problem. One should understand what one sh cannot really understand in depth. There is a difference between using a tool and collaborating with a tool and understanding how, what are the, especially the pitfalls of the tool. But otherwise we agree. Hi. <laughs> okay, we still have time for questions. Yes. Just stand up and speak loud and maybe you'll even have to repeat the question.
question, especially for the audience. You're relying on, on my working memory too much. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will, I will uh, repeat what I got. For that. Uh, and there is other questions uh, out from there. Uh, there was a, suge a suggestion to add another classification to the sort of classification that we had there, which would be none of the above. But that's always the case, of course, because we do not cover everything. But if I understood you, you said we should add a classification based on uh, or geared toward the, the infrastructure needed in order to train brain researchers at this state of the art. And uh, although I think that infrastructure is extremely important, infrastructure, if you refer to conceptual infrastructure, like having a lab where you have people from physics and mathematics and <coughs> biology and psychology, then I agree. I think that that's the only way to proceed. And I think in most of our cases, when we look at our labs, that's what you see. But if you refer to infrastructure in terms of the barzellim, yeah, of the, the real so infrastructure, then it's, it's a problem because infrastructure tends to, to, to dissipate, to, to become a sort of useless within a very short time. If I would have taken a picture of the infrastructure in my lab in Caltech in uh, the mid-70s, okay, and bring it here, uh, or Yoram uh, in, 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 in Colombia in the 80s. Yoram, your family is here, we were together in Colombia in the 80s, and we would have taken the infrastructure, including part that he built himself, yeah? It would be most of it, except the part that he built himself, look, he's a cat, I'm not going to argue with him, uh, <laughs> then this is useless now. So infrastructure has a generation time which is shorter than the ideas that drive it. Therefore, I'm careful about the infrastructure. Also, I'm not inclined to that. But your point is well taken. Go on, don't tell I think it would be useless. He said it could be useless. Would be useless. Oh, he would be useless. Thank you, sir. I'm careful with your answer. I'm happy to, this time to agree with Yadin to see that he is also more uh, open minded uh, at least in terms you of uh, at least <laughs> with regards to the Barcelona, not with regards to the people. Uh, uh, I, I completely agree. We are talking about a new generation of students and researchers and uh, they should not be intimidated by infrastructure but even by tools and uh, I said even by sort of disciplines within the discipline. Uh, we should uh, uh, train and educate students that can choose the tools uh, that are open to the questions that they're interested in. Another short question? Yes. No short question. Short question? Okay. Short. Sure. How do you study a system that a uh, function that changes? But I have to understand changes over what time scale? Uh, over evolution, <coughs> I don't care. Of the organism. I see. So, for example, memory that develops from a certain type of memory to another. Then there are two possibilities. The one that most of us select if they don't study developmental biology is to study a certain, let's say, if we study episodic memory, you never study it in individuals, in humans, well, you, not never, but you uh, try not to study, from my point of view, individuals are uh, younger than 25, because their frontal cortex is not developed well. Uh, don't take it personally. Sorry, don't take it personally, but that's why we go into the army at the age of 18. <laughs> so, it's, it's well known now that uh, the inhibition is not uh, and if you are a politician, it goes up to 65 minutes. <laughs> so either you select a, a sort of a time window, or your research topic is the change. Yeah, so that's, that, that's, the, that's the hierarchical and not fixed definition of a function. Uh, if you look at the perspective of the lifetime of an organism, then the dynamics of, what, of the processes, they are part of the overriding function or functionality of that organism, whether it's survival or production or, or whatever. Uh, but, uh, but practically, we, we, in research, we are looking at different, at smaller chunks of function, uh, and those smaller chunks may be either 
as a convenience uh, a, a function at, the, at a given time, shorter time, and we pretend that this is uh, stationary, or as has been said, the very change of the process serves an overall function. And that's the way to think about it. it. There is no fixed answer to it. It depends on your perspective and the scale at which you look at the system. Actually, if you take, your, your example is beautiful, I, can, I can sort of developed over the past few minutes. And you can use the change as a, as a tool to unveil the function of the system. And uh, thank you for uh, inspiration. Okay, thanks for speaking again.